For a county historical museum, we got an extraordinary donation in 2016 from Jed McGee uh, of his collection, uh, most all of his collection, lifetime collection of memorabilia, books, photographs, paintings of Abraham Lincoln. Um, Jed, had, a native of Dunkerton in northeast Iowa, he went to Iowa U, right? Went to Iowa U, on in uh, law school, then came to Jefferson and opened a law practice here. And his career has sort of been 20 years in Jefferson, 20, 20 years in Charles City or thereabouts, and now back to Jefferson with his wife Betty, and she started the printer's box, as you may remember from the first go around here. They were very active in the community in their first stay here, loved the place, and when Af Jed was then appointed to the bench and served as an Iowa District Court judge based in Charles City, right? Uh, and then eventually retired in 2015 and was deciding where they wanted to land and they decided to come back to Jefferson, for which we are really grateful. They have become very active players in the community again. So we're grateful for that. But this collection, uh, two great things about this. It's just full of interesting stuff. And this is from an earlier story I wrote about just about this to kind of frame it up. Uh, his fascination with Lincoln, are you getting into this in your talk today? His fascination starts in seventh grade in Dunkerton. His teacher thought he needed more of an academic challenge. So she took him to, to some uh, public, told him to pick out some public figure that he would be interested in and he could do some research on it. And he picked, he read a book about Lincoln who served as president from 1861 until his assassination in 65. And he decided that was it. And his teacher bought him his first scrapbook for a dollar and 29 cents. And he started cutting out articles he found about Abraham Lincoln. He still has the scrapbook, right? And uh, that launched him into a lifelong interest in the former president and great American. Um, he kept this collection for most of his career years in his office in Charles City. And after he, he and Roger Egeter, our executive director, negotiated that this, most of this collection was going to come here, which is basically across the east end of the museum here, uh, what they delivered here was <laughs> just amazing. It included 10 shelves full of books about Lincoln, 30 busts of Lincoln at different stages of his life, including two that are more than 100 years old, the paintings, pr 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 prints I mentioned earlier, and more. Um, and then as it was coming in here, I asked Jed about that time, how many books he's read on Lincoln, and he said hundreds. <laughs> and uh, still is looking for them and, uh, and glad to share the information. I said there's two great things about having this collection here. One is the collection, which people are going to be coming to this museum for decades into the future. It's one of the best collections about Lincoln you can find anywhere in Iowa and beyond, really. But the second thing is Jed's here, <laughs> which means about twice a year, for the past several years, he's done programs, he's done chats on all different aspects of the Lincoln life and career, and we have learned a ton about this in, in, in those presentations. So, Thank you all for another tremendous turnout here to, again here today. And join me in welcoming Jed McGee, who's going to talk to us today about Mr. and Mrs. Abraham Lincoln, the couple. Jed McGee. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. I get to wear this tie once a year. <laughs> it's just to get the group and this crowd fired up. And it's a pretty warm day today. Uh, I want to piggyback a couple things that Chuck said. Uh, when Roger and I made the deal to put this collection here, and there's also three shelves of books back there. Uh, when we made that deal, he came to Charles City, and I was still living in Charles City. And by the time we got done, we had two vehicles and 41 boxes. <laughs> here. So, and I had it all in my office at one point. Uh, the other thing I want to say is about this museum. Um, because I made that donation, I think it was kind of blackmail. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you serve on the board for the historical society? So that's a 
that's the first extracurricular job I took here after I moved, and it's been a great job. And I'm continually impressed with this museum. If you don't come here and visit often, you should, because you can't see it all in one trip. And we're making progress, we're making new things all the time. Uh, we have lots of great programs, thanks to Chuck and Margaret and, and a few other people. And this is a Lincoln Highway exhibit also, right? Yes. And it's interactive. You can turn on the button and listen to a, a dialogue about that Lincoln Highway. Thanks a lot and, and Joyce. Um, I want to set the stage for you a little bit uh, before I really begin. Uh, as Chuck has alluded to, I had been, spent many years studying about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, but I paid little attention to his marriage. I knew about it. Well, everybody knows about Mary Todd Lincoln and never said it any other way. Uh, and I'm surprised when I started getting ready for this talk how many books there were about Abraham, Mrs. Abraham Lincoln. And this is just a sample. And I could have had twice that many. Well, the bottom three or four are, are uh, I'm alone from the library. But even the most, the most recent one that I found was by Dr. Michael Burlingame. I've got, I've got the label on the front. But he's a noted historian in Illinois, I think the University of Illinois, and Lincoln, a Lincoln expert. And this book was written in, in 2021. Wow. So people are still writing books about Mary Todd Lincoln. And this was called An American Marriage. Actually, I was disappointed in the book, although Burlingame is a real historian and a real expert, is very, very critical of Mary Todd Lincoln. She had lots of critics and, and was disliked, but uh, he went beyond the pale as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and he, he gives a lot of quotes, but he doesn't give citations of where they came from. So as a historian, I was disappointed in his book because he didn't tell me where he got that information. But it's pretty extensive. Uh, another good one in a fairly recent book is uh, uh, by um, Gene Baker, it's also 2000, uh, in the 2000s. And another one by Catherine Clinton that I'll refer to later. Uh, the other books that I had, that I used, were right there in these shelves. One is Irving Stone's Love is Eternal. How many have heard of that book, or that phrase? Now, that's a very famous phrase for Mary Lincoln. That was inscribed inside Mary's wedding ring. Uh, this funny thing about this book, it's a novel. It's not historical, it's a novel. But it's, it's interesting. Uh, so I had some of my own books that I could use to start this. And then I'm sorry that this is a good way to display this. But to start, I want to show you a picture of that young couple. This was actually four years after they were married. And this is one of the books from the shelves back here. The thing about Mary and Abraham Lincoln. As I said, and a lot of people know the phrase Mary Todd Lincoln, they are one of the most notable presidential couples. Think about uh, Bill and Hillary, about uh, FDR and uh, Eleanor, Barack and Michelle, John Adams and Abigail Adams. Uh, same way as Lincoln, uh, Abraham Lincoln and Mary Todd. Uh, well known as a couple, but probably for a lot of different reasons. Uh, They were probably the original odd couple in the White House. In fact, I think they were the, she was the first person to be called First Lady. Um, and she almost insisted on it. In fact, she really wanted to call it, one of the people who addressed her as Mrs. President. That's how egotistical she was and ambitious she was. Her critics say this about her. A man grasping, selfish, harridan, unloving, unloved, the president's most painful bird in a thief. That's what they said about her while she was in the White House. Others, friends and neighbors back in Springfield, Illinois, said she was an ardent wife, a devoted mother, a sensitive woman. To the South, because she was from Kentucky, and so was Lincoln. But to the South, she was a traitor. To the North, she was a spy. So she really couldn't win either way. And that all played out in four years of the Civil War. But Michael Burlingame, the 
historian here, also gives uh, some, I don't want to call it credit, but some of the uh, uh, emotional parts of it to Abraham Lincoln. He said about Abraham and being married as a married husband that he was depressing. Uh, he was emotionally reserved. He was uncommunicative. All those things apply. He had bouts of depression all of his life. And uh, it's times and times where he got very, very down, way down. At a minimum, Mary was a shrew. <laughs> At most, she was a hellcat, <laughs> a she wolf, described by Lincoln's own law partner. There's a real mutual dislike, by the way, between Mary Todd Lincoln and uh, William Herndon. Lincoln <clears throat> worked for 16 years. They hardly spoke to each other. Harsh view, uh, as I said, by Michael Burlingame. But Jean Baker, one of the authors of one of these books, said that this is what he said, she said about, uh, about Lincoln. Uh, he daily practiced tolerance of a cantankerous female. And that's, there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, she was difficult to live with. But very brilliant, very talented, very able. But they were the most as, as uh, Baker also said, they're the most unlikely couple to ever grace the White House. And even her relatives said, well, opposites attract. <laughs> and that's true. Except for one thing, their intellects <coughs> They were much in sync. Well, so the question is, did she make his life miserable, as some people say? Or was she a loving, supporting wife with temper and anger issues? There's no question she was bipolar. People, I think, established that over the years. Uh, and it came through. Uh, and she had terrible migraine headaches. And those of you who had experienced migraine headaches, you can understand uh, that. Uh, really affects your life. But let me, let me back up. That's the sort of background or preface. Mary Ann Todd was born in Lexington, Kentucky in 1818. In one of the premier houses, her father was Robert Todd, a wealthy businessman, had dry goods, he had cotton manufacturing, he was the clerk of the legislature. Her grandfather was one of the founders of Lexington, Kentucky. She was born in a mansion. I can get this photo up. I have to have Carson help me. That's not her. <laughs> <laughs> That's the house she was born in, in Lexington, Kentucky, in 1818. Think about a premier house. Compare that to where Abraham Lincoln was born. Uh, and the, she has siblings, three or four siblings. Uh, but uh, it was a premier city, a premier place in Kentucky. In fact, it was often called the Athens of the West, Lexington. Really premier city ahead of a lot of other places. They owned slaves. The uh, Todd. Some of them didn't want to go in Kentucky, manufacturing cotton. Michael Burlingame, you know, one of the uh, historian that talks about her, here's what he said about the Todds. Well, let me tell you first what Abraham Lincoln said about the Todds. Well, when God, you speak of God, one D is enough, but D, two D's is what's required to be a Todd. <laughs> This is what Burlingame said about the Todds. They were pampered, prideful, quick-tempered. Some were violent, cruel, mad, and eccentric. That's the whole family. And truly, once you read about them and find out about them, and I find out in these, some of these books, they had a lot of crazy people in their family. Uh, some of them went insane. Some were drunkards and alcoholics. Some killed themselves. Uh, some died in uh, the war on the wrong side, if you were Union. But they were uh, an eclectic, eccentric family. Compare that beginning to Abraham Lincoln. And when she was born in 1818, guess where he was? He was nine years old. He was born in 1809. He was trudging with his family through the snow and the water and the mud, moving from Kentucky into Indiana. It's the southern border of Indiana across the Ohio River in, uh, in the wilderness. Bears, 
wildcats, all kinds of wild animals, virgin forest, building a one-room cabin with a half space when they first built it didn't have a fourth wall, I wanted three walls. Uh, and uh, that's where, they, where he spent his year that year. Shortly after they moved there, of course, his mother, Mary Todd, Mary uh, Nancy Hanks, died in 1818. Um, Thomas left his two children, Sarah and Abraham, and his cousin Dennis Hanks in that cabin in the woods. Went back to Kentucky to find a new wife. Left them for four months in the woods. Mm -hmm. the woods. Mm -hmm. As I can imagine. Compare that to living in this house. Uh, and he found Sarah Bush Johnson back in Kentucky, paid her debts, uh, and married her and brought her and her three children back to the villages. Uh, what's interesting is uh, Thomas Lincoln basically was in the room. He could bungalowly sign his name, as Lincoln said. His mother, Nancy Hanks, was illegitimate and also in the room. Uh, was a lovely person. Uh, his stepmother, Sarah Bush Johnson, was also a deliverer. Uh, Surprised me. I didn't know that until I went up recently. But she was a, a real motivator for Abraham Lincoln. She bought some, brought some luxuries to their house in the woods in Indiana. First of all, she brought books. You know, she was illiterate. She had books. First time he had actual books. Other luxuries she brought were knives, forks, and spoons and furniture, which they had not on. And the first thing she insisted that Thomas Lincoln do was cover up that dirt floor, put in a plank floor, and a wall for the kids. Compare that to this beginning. Mm -hmm. What a contrast with two people. Again, they lived in that wilderness that were dirty and kind and wild. Uh, that was 1818, when his mother died. When Mary Ann Todd was six, her mother died in Lexington. She turned out to be a very traumatic event. Because her father, Robert Todd, quickly remarried. Married a gal by the name of Betsy. To give you an idea of her, her lineage, uh, Betsy's uncles were doctors, a senator, one was a minister to France. Again, compare that to Abraham Lincoln's beginnings. One of the problems and trauma, other traumatic things for Mary, Mary uh, Ann Lincoln, was that her father and new, uh, new wife immediately began another family. They had nine more kids. Nine kids. So they moved from this house to a different house. But that created a real problem. Uh, one of the first children was named Ann. So Mary Ann Todd became Mary Todd to avoid confusion. The other problem was that Grandma Todd uh, didn't like the new wife, Betsy. So she interfered with her life constantly and complained and criticized. The other thing is that Betsy and none of the kids got along. They despised her. Because she was having kids all the time, they had kids for little kids, for one thing. Plus, they weren't her kids. Uh, so it just caused trouble. Plus, Robert, and the businessman, was gone a lot. Mary, and now Mary Todd was totally ignored, basically. Uh, Betsy, whose stepmother called Mary, the limb of Satan. Oh. How's that for her stepmother? <laughs> so as a result, she was farmed out to a boarding school, finishing school first, one small finishing school, then secondly to another one called Madam's, uh, Madam, uh, uh, I can't think of the name, uh, Mentel's, at a Mentel's finishing school. Basically, even though she lived at home because her family had moved to this new house, uh, uh, basically she was a boarding, uh, at a boarding school. She didn't go home very much. You know, it's in the same town, Lexington. Didn't go home so much because there was so much risk in the family with, with uh, stepchildren and stepmother. But she excelled at school. Brilliant, brilliant. That's one reason her stepmother didn't like her because she was outspoken. She was bright, intelligent. Uh, she um, uh, excelled in French, uh, in discourse, and in social graces. Uh, the room I moved to uh, uh, after the first one was a 14 room house. In, that was in 1832. In 1835 was Mary's first visit to Springfield. And there, 
with very few eligible ladies in Springfield. It was still a frontier town. Um, so she was very popular. And they described her, the people contemporaries then described her as bright, curious, and lively. At age 20, in 1838, she moved out like her sister had, away from her stepmother, moved to Springfield to live with her sister, her sister Elizabeth, who was married to Minnie Edwards. He was a lawyer, politician. His father had been the territorial governor, so her hierarchy and her, her background stays the same. She's still involved with people of importance. And they lived in a premier house. I think I have a picture of that, I in this book. At the same time, this is when Mary moved to Springfield, and she stayed there. Never really went. She went back to visit this point, but never moved back. At the same time, Abraham Lincoln was living on the frontier in Indiana, hard labor, hired out the neighbors, building logs, uh, pulling up corn stalks, uh, plowing fields, settling in the frontier. And he did that for the next... Uh, uh, 10 or 12 years until he would be, until they moved to Illinois. He had little agent, uh, education, as you all know, about one year. Uh, and there also is very little history about Abraham Lincoln's life in that period, from 1818 to 1832 or so. Uh, not much is known other than just hard, hard work. Uh, they lived along the Ohio River, and one of the jobs he had was uh, on his own. Uh, he uh, somehow borrowed or bought a skiff, and the practice was that we drove people across uh, across the river, the Ohio River, or out to the, <coughs> the river, to take people to steamboats. They stopped in the middle of the river and they could get on the boat. He got sued. He was only like 15 or 16. Some guys across the river in Kentucky sued him into magistrate's court in Kentucky because you have to have a license to do that, to drove people across the river. And he didn't have a license. So he was violating the law and he should be fined. He pled his own case and argued his own case. And he won. He pressed the magistrate so much, he won. And his argument was, I didn't row across the river. Typical lawyer. <laughs> I only row it halfway. And I had a license to row across the river. The magistrate was so impressed that he threw the case out. <laughs> and then there's an offshoot to that. The magistrate was so impressed with him and his intellect that he let him come borrow his law books. That was his real beginning to talk about the law, uh, to study those books. Again, uh, until he was 21, his father took all his wages. That was the law. You know, kids uh, had to turn over the wages and their pay to their parents. They moved to Cole County, uh, Illinois. Uh, but again, very little known about that move or about the time between Indiana and Illinois. As soon as he was age 21, he left his father. They really then did not have a good relationship. Never did. Uh, he left. Um, he was used to hard work, but as he often said himself, I, I learned to work hard, but I never learned to love it. <laughs> so he uh, ended up in New Salem, Illinois, some distance from where his father lived. As he said, he was like a piece of driftwood. He just landed there uh, like a piece of driftwood. Became a clerk in the store. <coughs> Became a surveyor, taught himself surveying. He ran the post office. He was an assistant postmaster for a while. He owned the store for a while and incurred a huge debt, $1,200. He often referred to as a uh, national debt, but eventually paid it all off. He began reading the law when he found law books in one of the barrels at the general store. He was sponsored in learning more about the law by someone he met in the Black Hawk War. He was in the militia for 30 days in the Black Hawk War. He said, we never saw any onions and never had any uh, battles, but I bent my musket once real bad. <laughs> and the only fight they had was with wild onions. 
<laughs> John Todd Stewart was his captain in that militia. If you notice, his middle name was Ty. Guess what? The cousin of Mary Tom Lincoln. Lawyer, successful lawyer in Springfield. And he allowed Lincoln to come borrow his books uh, and to read the law. And then eventually they became partners. Before he became a lawyer in 1832, uh, and before Mary Todd met him, he ran and lost the receipt in the legislature. Second time around, he won. But he was so poor, he didn't even have money for a suit. He had to borrow money to buy his first suit to go to Springfield from the legislature. Uh, actually, it was in, in Vandalia at that time. But he had four different, four successive terms then in the legislature. Okay, Mary Todd comes to Springfield. As I said, she's very popular, very social. Lots of dances, lots of parties. Uh, Mindy and Edwards and Elizabeth, uh, her cousins, uh, were both to do, had lots of parties, lots of politics. Mindy was a very political person. Uh, and I should mention that one of the reasons that uh, Mary is involved in interest in politics in her home in Lexington, one of the guests in their home often was Henry Clay, uh, Senator Henry Clay, and one of the most well known politicians of the era. And eventually, John Todd Stewart brought his young partner, fellow legislator, to the house, to uh, Edward's house, to introduce him to Mary Lincoln. Um, again, she was very popular. Uh, he brought her to a party. Her sister Elizabeth, here's what she said. I don't know what, what they see in each other. They're polar opposites. That's a great endorsement from your family. <laughs> And Elizabeth further said, I don't see how they could ever live as husband and wife. That's another great start for marriage. <laughs> because Lincoln, as Elizabeth said, was crude, shy, unkempt, awkward. He liked social graces. He was uncouth. He was dull. What did she see in him? His pants didn't reach his shoes. He had bare shoes showing. And he wore... Uh, as they described, Conestoga boots, I call them clod hoppers. Uh, can you imagine that in this elegant house uh, when they met? But Mary had such an intellect, and so did Lincoln, that they enjoyed poetry, they recited Shakespeare together, and then politics. They loved politics. And he was a great storyteller, he was in the legislature. <coughs> To show you how awkward he was, and he was like this around most women, the first dance he went to, he, he said to his partner, well, how clean all those women look. <laughs> <laughs> That's his social graces. <laughs> and others described him then as the plainest man in Springfield. <laughs> he was a real hick. <laughs> and think about his background, even though he's in the legislature. <coughs> Another thing that uh, shows uh, uh, maybe some, some uh, indication of their future together was that <coughs> one of their first dances at the Edwards' house. And he finally got enough courage to talk to Mary and be introduced to her. So and finally, after a while, he said, Well, I'd like the dancers in the worst way. <laughs> they dance. Her comment, well, well verified law. Well, you certainly proved your point. <laughs> and that's in the worst way. <laughs> to give you another historical tidbit, in Springfield, when they were uh, seeing each other, she had lots of suitors because wealthy family, smart, vivacious, pretty. Not real pretty, but she was, what other authors say, is pleasingly plump. But she was fairly attractive. But she had lots of suitors, including Stephen A. Douglas. And some people who put her together with thinking that they might get married, because he was a real, really up and coming uh, politician in Illinois. But she was, a, as Burling Games said, she was a creature of excitement. And that's what drew them together. Together they talked politics uh, constantly. One of the things they did was they started writing letters to the one of the newspapers, picking on James Shield, who was a state auditor. And he was kind of he was kind of a fop, dandy. Thought he was handsome, 
Urbane, and all the women should fall for him. So they wrote these letters from the Lost Township and signed them Aunt Rebecca. He was so incensed he demanded to find out who wrote these letters. The editor finally said, well, Lincoln and his bunch, there were several women. And Mary was highly involved, but Lincoln, to protect her, said, well, I wrote them, I wrote them. Uh, and, then, and you probably will remember the story that James Shield immediately challenged him to a duel, which took place. They had to go to the middle of the Mississippi River on an island because it was illegal to do in Illinois. Lincoln, as a challenged person, had the option of the weapons. And uh, I mean, he wasn't in favor of the war, he was a nonviolent person. So, choice of weapons for Lincoln was army broadswords at five feet. Of course, he's six feet three and he has arms this long, and his sword is this long. We go out in the middle of the morning in the middle of the river on this island, he's waving his sword around. The other guy had second thoughts. <laughs> so he apologized, they called the duel off, and all was well. At some point, uh, well, as some people have said, Birmingham and others, uh, during this period, uh, Lincoln was the one doing uh, was doing the calling, but Mary was the one doing most of the courting. Uh, she really went after him. She really felt he was destined for greatness. Nobody really knows why she thought that he figured that out, other than his intellect. But he did most of the courting. So sometime in about 1838, they discussed their relationship. They even discussed marriage uh, and sort of an um, informal engagement. There was no ring. There was no announcement. There were no parties. But that was everybody understood. But, uh, and the other interesting thing about that time, uh, another young cousin of Ninian and Elizabeth Edwards moved into their house. It's very common back then for relatives to move and live with other relatives for months. Um, like she moved from Lexington, uh, came to Springfield. Well, about this time, they had another cousin come to live in the Ninian Edwards house by the name of Matilda Edwards, age 18. Beautiful. Vivacious. Lincoln fell for her, literally fell for her, and didn't know what to do. And he agonized and agonized about it. So finally, he broke her off of Mary, all off her engagement, asked if she would release him from his promise or his vows. But the young guy, age 18, really didn't pay much attention to him. He finally left. She was squared around town by everybody, uh, and really broke his heart. But she took off and don't know any more about her. Uh, but he told uh, Mary he didn't love her. And he told his friends, well, it would kill me if I married Todd Lincoln, if Mary Todd. They didn't socialize with each other for five months. He was so depressed about it and agonized about it so much, his friends took away his razors, his knives, and other arms because he was depressed and they thought he might harm himself. He talked to his friend Joshua Speed, who he lived with above his store. He said, I'm the most miserable man living. And Mary had released him from his promise. Later on, one of another one of the Todd cousins got him together, invited him to a party. Eventually, and by this time Lincoln was a lawyer, he had been in the legislature, he had passed the bar and he had become a lawyer. So he was well known. But they got back together <coughs> briefly, and on the spur of the moment, on November 4, 1842, Mary told her sister Elizabeth, well, we're going to get married. Well, she said, oh, well, tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth threw a tizzy, because she was elegant and genteel, and you don't just do that. you got to have a party, you got to have a venue. So she screwed around. <laughs> to get her house ready. <coughs> At the same time, Lincoln went to see the Presbyterian minister and said, would you perform a wedding? <coughs> he said, yes. The minister said, when? Tonight. <laughs> uh, and then he asked the bystander at the minister's house, will you be the best man? Stand up for him. <coughs> so they got married that night in this the house that I had the picture of up there, uh, the Edwards house. 
and she paid with it with her own money and her father's help. Uh, again, he was gone once almost for the whole season, six months. And think about that. She's got four kids. And she's at home with her husband out warrioring, doing the circuit. You've got to milk the cow, you've got to draw the water, you've got to clean the barn, you've got to take care of the horse, you've got to chop firewood, you've got to do the water, you've got to do the iron, you've got to do the cleaning. She did have some help off and on, but think about that role that she had in going from luxury and having slaves to doing uh, all those mundane chores without his help. And he was somewhat oblivious to it. When he came home, he chopped wood, he did all those things too. But, Oftentimes at night he was gone anyway. Again, she was bipolar, she had migraines. Uh, there was much turnover in her health because she was uh, pretty awful to a lot of her health because they didn't do things right or she'd have all her migraines. Uh, so a lot of turnover. Uh, and it depends who you ask. And I looked through these books about her life at home without Lincoln. I think a lot about that, how she, how she had to function. Uh, it depends who you ask about their married life uh, and what took place. Some people will talk about all the tension she threw, throwing things at Lincoln, cups of coffee at him, screaming, leaving, running out the door. But he would leave, he'd go to his office, sometimes at midnight, sometimes on weekends. Sometimes he'd take one of the boys with him or not to his office. But some neighbors said she was friendly. She was a good mother, although she could be mean-spirited, short-tempered, and high-strung. So from 1849 to 1954, basically, um, she was not involved in politics. She was practicing being a lawyer uh, and earning a living. And during that period of time, I had to marry Lode. Her mother died, her grandmother died, and their little boy, Eddie, died. Again, the Lincoln absent much of the time. As her sister Elizabeth said, uh, she had much to bear, and she don't bear it very well. Burlingame, the historian, says it was a psychological neediness. Others talk about roles of service, but Lincoln, because of his background, losing his mother, no relationship with his father, having difficulty relating to women, treated her as a surrogate child. He was a, as a parent to her. Others say that she was just the opposite, but she had such an awful childhood. She was needy and she was looking for a surrogate father, which she didn't really get because he was gone all the time. So some of the psychological stuff was interesting. But she was an, uh, ambitious and pushed him. They got back into politics, basically during the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the, the Fusion Slave Act where uh, Congress passed a bill that you found in a runaway slave. You had to turn him in or you were guilty of a felony. Uh, he got really involved in that. The backside retailer was president. Then he got involved in, when they formed the Republican Party in 1854, which really put him on the track for being wrong from home, being a politician. She was ambitious, ambitious for him, and often told people, I'm going to be the wife of a president someday. She often said that. People really kind of laughed about it, nobody knew quite where that came from. Uh, one way she did some of this, he was offered a chance to be the governor of Oregon, of the Oregon Territory, if you can imagine, sort across the country. But uh, he was inclined to take it, she got him to turn it down. So he did turn it down, that was in uh, 1840. And she did, she often commented, I'm going to be the wife of a president. As growing in, the historian says, their strongest bond was political ambition. And Lincoln's ambition was the little engine that knew no rest. And you think about it, the more you know about Lincoln, it's really true. He had lots of ambition uh, and uh, forged ahead. And Mary supported him, although her life at home was pretty, uh, pretty hectic. And other people say, well, it was her constant nagging that spurred him on. And others said, well, it was that disagreeable home life that encouraged him to get into politics because it could be away from home. But he was often gone for lawyering and speaking, and uh, 
debates. I know for a fact one trip he took during that period was to Troy, Kansas. Now think about going to Kansas in 1850 and there There was no bridge across the Mississippi River. There was a railroad across the state of Iowa. No bridge across the Missouri River. So you had to travel by carriage, a boat across the river and carriage. Troy, Kansas to make a political speech. I think that's just incredible. Mm -hmm. now, I know it because I've been there. I saw his bust in the house that he, that he spoke mm -hmm. at. But that's how far he went, how much he was gone away from her. That would have been a week or two trip. Uh, this is an example. 1860, he was elected. Uh, he was nominated. Uh, back then, pan candidates didn't speak, didn't campaign. He stayed in Springfield. Uh, but the reason he got there was because in 18, early in 1860, he went to New York to give a speech called the Cooper Union speech. One of the most famous speeches, and they've often said the one that made him president. Uh, but he spent three or four or five weeks on the East Coast, Boston, New York, uh, New England, giving speeches and become, becoming well known. Where was Mary all this time? All taking care of kids. And the house. Think about that. It's a real difficult situation. And I guess I would say he was somewhat oblivious to that, but his ambition was such that he did that and he left her alone with those children. And of course he was um, elected um, with an interesting note. Stayed at home all during the campaign, didn't go out to speak, uh, uh, was elected. I sat by the telegraph. News came by telegraph. He excused himself from the group and said, I gotta go home because there's a little woman at home who's more interested in this than I am. <laughs> and this says, says a lot if you think about it. Because as she said many times, I'm gonna be married to a person. Um, but she fussed and fussed and fussed at him because he didn't roll one on his cuffs. He answered the door in his shirt sleeves, he didn't put on his jacket, he laid on the floor when there were guests present. Um, one time he answered the door and somebody asked him about uh, marrying some ladies. He said, well, I'll trot the ladies out. And this, uh, and that was one time when she lost him and uh, chased him out of the house. He <laughs> trot the ladies out to the front door. Uh, but she was more interested, or at least as much interested in his election than she was. Of course, hotbed of politics in the Civil War is just fomenting when he's elected. So much so that there were already threats to his life before he ever left Springfield. So, as a bunch of caution, not because Lincoln wanted to, a bunch of caution, they took separate trains. He and Mary took separate trains to Washington, D.C., met up in Washington. And of course, when he went through Baltimore, they put him under disguise in a secret coach and moved him across the city. So, uh, assassins that were waiting for him couldn't find him. Uh, she resisted, but uh, all the powers that be insisted they take separate trains. Now it begins another era. They're in Washington, D.C. He's the president. Of course, immediately, Fort Sumter happens. War starts. Mary, in her role, she wants to be known as Mrs. President. Congress had appropriated $20,000 for the upkeep of the White House and decorations. The previous presidents, especially Andrew Jackson, had trashed it. He was from Tennessee. All his friends came from Tennessee with their muddy boots and their coonskin caps. And basically, it was a, it was a hollow. The White House was just a mess. Muddy carpets, torn, everything. Paint, wallpaper. So she spent the $20,000. The allocated amount was $20,000 for a four-year term. She spent that $20,000 the first year. That was her first mistake. So she did not make friends with Congress and a lot of other people. So they spent her. She made many trips to New York to buy things for the White House. Really benefited the country and the White House. Furniture, dishes, all kinds of things. Uh, but she did overspend. She had some friends that in Congress who went with her and helped her. Uh, Some of those funds, and Lincoln ended up paying for himself. 
In addition to that, Mary managed to become disliked almost by everybody because she let me know who she didn't like. The first person was, uh, was uh, Edward Salmon, the Secretary of War, who couldn't stand it. Secondly, it was Lincoln's two secretaries, John Hay and John Nicolay. They called her the Hellcat. <laughs> her sister, Elizabeth, said at that era, she acted foolishly, unwisely, and made the world hate her. Uh, not intentionally, but she just didn't know how to do it. Another great rivalry, she was extremely jealous of any woman that was around Lincoln. Uh, nobody, I think, has ever figured out quite why. But one of those women was Kate Chase, who was the daughter of Simon Chase, uh, Secretary of Treasury. He was uh, his wife, he was widowed. So his daughter Kate, who was probably the most beautiful woman in Washington, D.C., was his hostess. Because of that, because she was so visible, beautiful, active, confident, never hated her. Forbid her to come to the White House. Forbid Lincoln to stand beside her. Uh, wouldn't shake her hand. Those kinds of things. She snubbed a lot of people. Another example is when, uh, after the after Richmond fell, and Lincoln and the entourage, including Murray, went to Richmond to view the city of Richmond. Lincoln was on a horse. Colonel was escorting him, and his young wife was with him on another horse. Mary was in a carriage. She threw a fit in the midst of all of, of the official stuff forbid the lady to ride next to her husband, demanded Lincoln demote the colonel, and, and, or, or sack him one or the other. And that's how extreme she became. Probably kind of romantic, depressive sort of thing. But in addition to that, you know, adding to her burden, uh, their son Willie died in the White House, right in the midst of battles and civil war battles. Her depression became even worse. People questioned her sanity. Lincoln at one point himself took her to the window when they stayed at the soldiers' home out in the country in the summertime, going to St. Elizabeth's Mental Hospital and said, Mother, you need to get straight out or that's where they'll put you. Uh, he was that concerned about it. Her sister Elizabeth came from Springfield, Illinois to help. <clears throat> at the same time, the uh, city of uh, D.C. had a broad outbreak of cholera, and by this time she had run up debts of $25,000, which William Lincoln paid off himself. Another example of, uh, of their relationship and, and uh, difficulties, uh, once at a cabinet meeting, uh, Butler came in to interrupt the cabinet meeting and said, you're wanted. That's so all he said. Lincoln ignored it, Butler left. Ten minutes later, about says, she says you're needed. He immediately left the meeting. <coughs> That's the kind of power that she had over the relationship he had. She got him to appoint relatives, including her brother-in-law, Nina Edwards, in uh, uh, Springfield, to positions in the government. At least one of her half-brothers was killed in the Confederate Army. Uh, maybe another one. Uh, but people have called her insensitive and uncaring. But she visited the hospitals. She uh, helped soldiers and visited soldiers during the war. Didn't get much press for it, but she did. Another difficulty, because she was from Kentucky and her, her relatives, some of them fought for the South, she had a sister in law that lived in Alabama. They had a death back in Kentucky. Sister-in-law wanted to come visit the family in Kentucky, asked the president, Lincoln, for a pass to get through the lines to go to Lexington. He denied it. Uh, so the press and other people accused that lady of wanting to smuggle, accused Mary of uh, aiding and abetting smuggling, uh, accused her of being a spy, even though Lincoln had denied the pass. It was interesting. About the same time to add to all the other things, Mary had a severe carriage accident and uh, hit her head and had a concussion. So she took her weeks and weeks and weeks to recover. Um,
There's a picture of Mary and two of her boys. That's what the photo went to Washington. There's another picture of her. Um, this was in Washington. So she, she was not an unattractive person. There's a most famous picture of her. Uh, if you can all see it. Um, that was taken out, I think, as the inauguration gown. Uh, beautiful, beautiful picture. There is one of the last pictures of her. There's a widow. I'm going to talk about that now. The war was over. Lee had surrendered. They'd been to Richmond. And of course, on April 14, 1865, they went to Ford Theater to see American Cousin uh, play. Mary really didn't want to go. Uh, Lincoln liked plays. And he was kind of reluctant to go, but he said, it's been announced, and it's been announced that the president would be there, so I better go, because people are expecting me, even though he didn't really want to go. They invited uh, U.S. Grant and his wife, Julia, to attend. Uh, Julia hated Mary Lincoln, <laughs> and they had a son in, uh, in uh, college, so they were going to visit him, so they begged off. And they uh, were not there. The second person who was supposed to be there was uh, Lord Lamont Hill, who was Lincoln's friend from Springfield, was his bodyguard, personal bodyguard, just because he was a friend. He asked, he had an engagement or something, he asked to be excused to go somewhere else, and Lincoln gave him permission to leave. As a result, they did have a bodyguard, but he was downstairs at the bar when John Wilkes Booth went upstairs. <coughs> And he shot Abraham Lincoln in front of his wife. Now she's already lost her father, her grandfather, two children, and now her husband shot her in front of her. A lady that's prone to many depressive episodes, depression, ice cream. In fact, it was so bad that uh, they had to forcibly remove her from the Peterson house across the, across the street when they put Lincoln. Because she uh, keened and carried on so much, uh, they finally had to remove her. But son Robert was there at least. And of course, because she had created such a swath of ill will with people, um, nobody came to visit her. She was in the White House basically alone for 40 days. She stayed at the White House. Vice President, now President Andrew Johnson, did not call on her, did not come to see her. Her family from Kentucky, nobody came from Kentucky. She was by herself with her son Robert and her son Tad, who was 12. When she finally moved out, she had 50 trunks worth of belongings. She had bought so much stuff for herself. But she didn't go back to Springfield to her house. She didn't go back to Kentucky to her family. She went back, she went to Chicago. That's where her son Robert lived. Robert was a lawyer, became president of the Pullman Railroad Company. She did move in with him. She moved into a shady, tacky, dingy hotel instead of Robert's house. Then she went to Europe for two years with Tad, her younger son. And then he died. Typhoid, diphtheria, or blood poisoning, or something. He was about 16. So her last child, she was connected with, except Robert, died. And then she came back for a little while, she's probably well. got angry at uh, Robert. First, she had no money because there was no pension for her lives and deceased presidents. She made a lot of enemies then because she worked hard in demanding a pension. She finally got a $5,000 pension. I think Robert helped her and Lincoln's lawyer friends helped her. Uh, so she got a $5,000 pension. But then she went back to Europe, a small town in France, for another three years, again by herself. She wasn't <coughs> being well to do because Lincoln had purchased bonds and she had a pension, but she constantly worried about money. She became a hoarder and a shopper. 
came back to Chicago, uh, again, where Robert lived, but did move in with him, again moved into a shabby hotel. As a result, one of Lincoln's friends, Leonard Sweat, who was a fellow lawyer and good friend from Springfield, nobody really knows the reason, although I have a book here about the trial of Mary Todd Lincoln. They alleged she was insane. And they got son Robert to agree with it. So in 1875, uh, they had a trial. They came to her hotel, put her in handcuffs, took her away without any notice, without any belongings, and took her to the courthouse where all the people were waiting including her son Robert, and 17 witnesses to testify that she was insane. She never had a lawyer, never a chance to talk to a lawyer. Leonard Sweat was her family lawyer. Well, I take that back. She did have a lawyer that was appointed, but he asked no questions. He had no opportunity to ask questions or cross-examine anybody. Basically, it was a kangaroo court. And at that time, Mary's comments was towards her son Robert, who they were estranged. She called him the monster of mankind. She was never examined by a doctor. The judge found her insane, sent her to a place called Belvedere Place in Chicago, outside Chicago, which was, she ended up with a private room with no bars on the window and a carriage so she could come and go and tour around as she wanted to. As long as she came back, and was there at night. Uh, after three months, she finally got another lawyer friend, and she was released in three months, uh, which is really a sad, sad story. Uh, I she was not in the So she went to her sister Elizabeth back to Springfield finally, uh, after all that. Uh, went back to live with her sister Elizabeth. And Robert, son Robert, guilty conscience or what, he paid her sister $100 a month for her keep. They finally reconciled one of the girls that's gotten together. But as the historians say, she went to Springfield to die. And she died on July 16, 1882, age 63. I'm going to show you another picture. That house right there, that's the Edwards, or the Minion Edwards house in Springfield, Illinois. One of the ironic things of fate is that's where she and Abraham Lincoln got married in that living room. That's also the same place where she laid in state after she died, in the same room. I want to give you some quotes, or one short quote. And this is from um, Catherine Clinton, just come in. Rather sums it up, I think. Mary Lincoln failed miserably in the court of public opinion. She was flawed and brilliant all at once, and never rose to the heights of humanitarianism that her husband so admirably achieved. Yet she provided Abraham Lincoln with the space and support he required to achieve his goal, and with the emotional yeast he needed to become the wartime president he became. Her unconditional love sustains Lincoln's growth to greatness. She was a woman of intense intellect and passion, who stepped outside the boundaries of her time prescribed and suffered for it. She was someone who endured more personal loss and public humiliation than any other woman of her generation. Pretty much sums up the life of Mary Todd Lincoln and the life of Mr. and Mrs. Lincoln. Thank you all for being here. Questions? Jackie. Uh, do you think, uh, how do you think Mary would have been perceived had she been known? I think it went a lot differently. Uh, how is she be perceived today? I think it went a lot differently. But she was her own worst enemy in a lot of ways. Because she was very opinionated, she was very um, elitist in some ways, um, very critical, and spoke her mind. 
or less, you know, like bipolar, um, language and depression, and so on. I don't think it's going to be treated a lot differently. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's a good group for a lot of people, and in that spot, it shouldn't have happened. Shouldn't have. Marilyn Hoskinson said she was kind of rude. <laughs> and maybe, are you indicating she brought it on herself? Well, she insulted people in a place where she should have never have done things like that. She insulted people in he, places where he, she shouldn't have done something. Like that. He was in the presidency. Yeah, and, and actually, you think about her background, her home in Lexington was a political uh, hotbed. Lots of politicians, important people, and think tact and being uh, generous with people would be one of the attributes. But as somebody said, one of her sisters said, she had a miserable childhood, and it affected her the rest of her life. So she reacted to people. Do you think today's age, though, she would have been able to have gotten some do you think in today's in today's society would she have gotten more help in terms of like bipolar disease or whatever? Well, I, you know, so I have no question about it. Back then, you know, when you knew bipolar, you were just crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. And she did a lot of crazy things. Like her hotel room in Chicago was filled with boxes and boxes and, and dresses and hats and all kinds of things that she didn't need. She just shop, 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 shop. But that was part of her disease. Yeah. Yeah. has got one. Jed? Um, by the way, I was curious about the, the, the people, rel relatives, or anyone could just say, this woman is crazy, and they have a kangaroo board. When was it that people had some rights that, that your family just couldn't? Put you away in, in an asylum. The question is, how could the family just railroad her into a, an insanity hearing? And of course, that happened. And when you had powerful people, influential people back then, they could just about do whatever they wanted. And when did, when did that change? I don't know. It probably changed when people started to pass laws saying you couldn't railroad people like that. You had to have a hearing, you had to have some law, a lawyer, and had to have a proceeding to actually prove somebody was crazy. I mean, had no doctors examined her. I mean, that's just, to me, it's incredible. This is a done deal rubber stamp. How, how um, did you find out about the Kangaroo Board? Did you know that she was bipolar? Well, they didn't back then. How did, how did they diagnose that she was bipolar? I don't think they ever did. They just thought she was crazy. Uh, or manic depressive, whatever the term was in manic age back then. I don't think she was ever really diagnosed since historians got a hold of it. I mean, you, your lawyer and the district court judge, how did that hit you that she was not even represented by an attorney? And has that been a debate among attorneys and judges subsequently? Has that ever come up at conferences where they've talked about that case? Never talked about that case, uh, but as a lawyer, it strikes you right here, um, that kind of stuff could happen. And it still happens today in some circumstances. Due process, it's called due process. You know, up until not many years ago, juveniles couldn't have a lawyer in juvenile court. I mean, think about that. Uh, so it, it really hits me, hits me hard. Especially the fact that her husband was such a good lawyer and ethical. One of the things you always heard about Lincoln was how ethical he was. I mean, that would have appalled him, I believe. And this was his good friend, Leonard Sweat, who was a fellow attorney in Springfield that, that orchestrated all of this. I think he would have been appalled. Uh, Lincoln had a hard time during the Civil War getting rid of McClellan as general. Uh, and I wonder if uh, Mary Todd had any influence on him or an opinion of what she should do with uh, General McClellan or anything like that. That's a great question. The question is, Lincoln had a hard time controlling get rid of General McClellan. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't fight? And the question is, did Mary have uh, comments about that or say so about that? I've never found anything that talks about that. I think if I dug deeper, I might find something. 
but I've never read anything about her comments or input about my club. Politically, was she more ambitious, uh, more passionate politically than than he was? I th the question is, was she more passionate politically? <laughs> um, I think they were about equal as far as ambition and passion politically, but in different ways. He was a worker. He was a thinker. He did it through speeches and stuff. Uh, he did it through speeches and stuff, and she did it uh, by talking and, and, and creating things and pushing him to do things and pushing other people to do things. So I think they're both passionate, just different ways. Ambition? Would and she have had more ambition, drive politically? Well, again, the same answer. She, the same she was outwardly more ambitious, and she said, I'm going to, marry, I'm going to be married to the president. Lincoln never said, well, I'm going to be president someday. He, just, he was just as ambitious, but he did it by doing things. The legislature, running for the Senate, serving in Congress, giving speeches, um, taking positions on slavery, on um, the fugitive slave law, things like that. And he did it that way, where she was some more outspoken. That would have been very unusual at that particular time. That's why she was an unusual person, because she had such an upbringing, living in a house with politicians, at the dinner table every night, going to a finishing school uh, where you're taught to speak your opinions and to be bright and brilliant and not hold back just because you were a woman. Uh, of course, that probably, that hurt her as much as anything with the males in Washington, D.C., because she was outspoken and smart. Uh, but they didn't like that. One more? Anybody else? Well, Jed, thank you so much. Another outstanding.